Buenas tardes. Thank you for coming. I'm Julio Cesar Morales. And um, a couple of months ago, Anush Kapoor wasn't between us here. Um, it was just Glenn Ligon and myself with neon pieces that were talking to each other. But recently, the blob showed up in the middle there. But it has really beautiful reflections of both the neon pieces. So it's a really nice photo op to get not only one artist, but you get three artists in one with that piece there. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about myself, about my artwork. And um, the work is actually scattered throughout the museum. And so this is actually the first piece that you come in towards as um, you come in, um, in the museum. And we're going to lounge, walk a little bit over to the other set of works. And then we'll go downstairs uh, where the majority of the work is. Um, this work, um, the project is called Invaders. And basically this project um, is about the last 10 years of, of artworks that I've been working on. Um, not all the artworks in 10 years, but a uh, featuring um, specific works for the last 10 years. Um, this is one of the newest pieces. This is called Broken Line, and this is from 2019. And this piece, does anyone recognize what this is? This is the border. And so I grew up in, I was born in Tijuana, and I grew up between Tijuana and San Diego until I was um, 20 years old. I moved to the United States when I was five years old, and I moved literally one block. So I live the furthest you can in Tijuana. I'm not sure if you've been there, but people live up into the actual fence itself. And we moved to San Isidro, which was one block away, where I stayed there, went to high school, and then I ended up uh, going to San Francisco to attend the San Francisco Art Institute. And I stayed there about 20 years, and um, I actually came to Phoenix about six years ago to become the curator of Arizona State University Art Museum, where I'm, I've been working there for the last six years. And I really came to curating as an artist. I had an artist-run space in San Francisco for nine years called Queen's Nails. And Queen's Nails really was next to a place called Queen's Nails where you had your nails done. <laughs> and so I actually stole the name and I added projects to it. And so for two years, they didn't suspect anything. And so artwork showed up at the Queen's Nails. And it was you know, an hour before the show opened and, and these um, artists from Sweden were like, where's the work in a Swedish accent? And then I called FedEx and they're like, well, you, you already signed for it. So I had to go next door to Queen's Nails and explain that I've been stealing her name for two years. <laughs> they gave me the artwork, I gave them a bottle of champagne and turned the sign on for, for us. <laughs> And ever since then, people were really interested in how I curated as, as a, in a perspective as an artist. And then later on, I got all these other gigs, and you know, now I'm here in Arizona, in Phoenix as a curator. And um, I also wanted to let you know that um, being here in Phoenix has really changed a lot of my work in the sense that the work really is about my family. It's about my history with the United, from the United States to Mexico. And being here in Arizona, a lot of the work that you'll see today is really influenced and created um, specifically here in Phoenix. And of course, I, um, I, when I first started studying, actually, I started graphic design. And until recently, graphic design started to appear more in my artwork, more colors, uh, more um, lines. And so this piece, actually, um, I was thinking about design, but also I was thinking about our relationship between each other, between Mexico and the United States the current cultural climate, and the current idea of building another border fence, which led to me creating this work right here. Um, and this piece also is inspired by a book by an artist and cultural critic named Coco Fusco that wrote a book called Broken Line exactly 20 years ago. Um, this is an ongoing series called Undocumented Interventions. And this uh, project is based on, my again, my upbringing in Tijuana one day I was having a show at the San Diego Museum of Contemporary Art and in a newspaper, as I was installing an artwork, I saw that there was a Powerpuff Girl piñata with these human legs coming out of the piñata. And it turns out that, you know, regardless if you're building a $20 billion fence, um, people are always going to resort to uh, very creative and innovative ways in which to reunite with families, um, escape persecution, and so on. And so in this way, um, I figured out, did more research, and this is actually where I grew up in Tijuana in a place called Zona Norte. Zona Norte is very well known where you take your car, you get it real postered, 
uh, get a new paint job, you can get it, a body work done, but also you can get people inside cars. And so essentially for $500, you can have yourself inserted into a seat or a dashboard or for a couple hundred dollars, you can get a custom made piñata for a child to be inside of it. And so a lot of the, all, the, all the work in this series is basically failed border crossing attempts. And all the images come from the INS website, from Border Patrol uh, website. A lot of the material from my work actually comes from that. And so this is actually a picture of someone that was caught inside the car seat. I'm not sure. I know a lot of people from Phoenix go on vacation in San Diego. Some become more adventurous and go to Tijuana. And if you notice, when you cross back from Tijuana, the Border Patrol agent usually uh, touches the seat really hard if it's empty, and that's if someone's gonna react and say, ouch, because someone might be inside of it. Um, so a lot of this work, again, deals with my family. My family's very complicated. Um, if you were to go to uh, Christmas or Thanksgiving, maybe 10 years ago or 20 years ago, I would be sitting with my cousin, who's uh, uh, the youngest judge in Baja California, and to my left would be a police officer, to my other right would be a drug dealer, and to the back would be another uh, tunnel digger, um, and so on. So it's almost like almost anyone's family, the extended family, um, you know, they are your family, but they're dedicated to certain things that you have to imagine what they do to sustain themselves. And um, I'll say one more thing, and we'll see something downstairs, but when I was a kid, um, my cousins and I would spend our summers with my grandmother and grandfather in Tijuana. And there would be about five of us, and um, one crazy uncle who was actually really fun, he actually had a task for us every summer when we were there, and basically we would be digging tunnels. So he actually had a house behind my grandfather and grandmother's house, and he would lift this board up, and then um, he would say, if you help me dig this tunnel to get across the street, I'm gonna take you to see Lucha Libre tonight. <laughs> so, that was our incentive. And so we would be like, what are we doing here? And I, I still remember the smell of underground, the dirt, and my cousins and my brother and I digging this tunnel that led to nowhere. And only recently, in the last 15 years, they discovered actually tunnels between Mexico and the United States. When you walk down the, the, um, the stairs here, there's one piece that is in another series that is um, tunnels that were found between Mexico and the United States, and the one that you'll see here is the first one found from Tijuana to San Diego. The upper part of it is Tijuana, and the bottom is the tunnel into San Isidro and San Diego. And I collaborated with a um, architect, so everything's up to scale. And again, the imagery came from the Border Patrol INS website. Um, so this is actually watercolors. This is a really harsh reality in regards to crossing over. Sometimes it takes four hours. If you can imagine being stuffed in a chair, in a dashboard for four hours, in a piñata if you're four years old. And so to me, I work with any medium necessary according to what the piece is about. And so for me, for such a harsh reality, the softest medium and as an artist is watercolors. And so I learned watercolors to work on this body of work. And so sometimes I'll collaborate with architects, I'll collaborate with um, sign makers and musicians and video makers, but essentially every project is a little bit different and the medium always shifts. If you can turn around for a second, can someone tell me what, what you're reading? Um, I saw the invader sign. Yes, but up here. This right now. Read, read this. Can you, can you read this? Seven pounds of meth found in, in nacho cheese. Yes. So this is another project I, I have been doing called Narco Headlines. So basically these are actually, if you, if you um, go on your phone right now and Google seven pounds of meth found in nacho cheese, you're gonna see the picture. So again, these are failed border crossing attempts, not only with people, but with drugs. Um, and so the companion is next door, which is 3.5 pounds of drugs found in jalapenos. So basically, um, you know, if you go, you get nacho cheese and you have to have the jalapenos of the cheese. But, you know, what's interesting is, you know, it's always sort of demonized in regards to drug, um, drug trafficking, but um, the United States is actually the biggest consumer of drugs in the world, and Mexico is one of the largest um, um, uh, transporters of drugs as well. So it's, you know, sort of like a 
call and response. I mean, it's a, it's a really an informal economy. And so this ongoing work um, you'll see downstairs. This are vinyl pieces. The other pieces downstairs are actually hand-drawn watercolor um, text pieces I, I've made. So on your way down, make sure you check out the narco tunnel that is down there. And the drawing is actually part of a series called Narquitectos. And so this is at the point where cartels started to hire architects and engineers to design tunnels. And Narquitectos was a term that was um, created for that type of work. So I'll see you downstairs. Um, so right behind you are the other pieces I was mentioning before. Um, ketamine, holy water, they all have really great stories. Uh, nuns caught with cocaine in habits, a uh, bag of lollipops of coke with heroin. Um, one of my favorites is the first one, which is Mr. Potato Head full of ecstasy. So that basically had a Mr. Potato Head and there was a thousand pills of ecstasy in his head. Um, 4.5 pounds of cocaine found in dreadlocks was actually the first one I did. And um, this is just ink on paper. And um, this is a woman that was uh, smuggling cocaine in fake dreadlocks. But one of them started to leak. And so it caught the people's attention. And they found out that there was cocaine in the dreadlocks. Um, and again, you know, if you, if you type this into Google, you'll actually see the images of them. Um, and again, these are referencing our need in the US to consume drugs and also the creative ways in which people are getting drugs here. Again, regardless if you spend $20 billion on a new fence, this is what people are doing. Um, to the, oh, actually that's blocked. Um, to the left-hand side in this corner, there's actually a video that's about to begin called Boy in a Suitcase. And this piece was based on an actual story of an eight-year-old boy being smuggled from Morocco into Spain in a suitcase. And so what I did is I animated the suitcase um, to create the, the work itself. And um, there's a lot of colors and a lot of different um, graphics that are in the video. So it's an animation. And I really like using animation as a medium because it really gives you more of an abstracted view. And it's one of those things in the videos where you actually don't really see um, what you're looking at until it's revealed in the end as well. Um, and so it actually has a mirror on the floor that is actually um, mirroring the, the video and it really it's created so it looks like a suitcase that's open. Um, to my right here is um, the newest body of work and this is called Strangers When We Meet. This is made in uh, this year and these are images of people crossing over um, and these are found images of their journey here and the color graphics that you see are actually samples of what's on the floor. So I've taken the actual images and made them into black and white and I also inverted the image, but in the color versions, you see some of the things that are on the floor and the ground as they're crossing into their journey here. And I wanted to create this uh, graphic field with that. And if you move a little bit more, can this is actually two videos. Um, and this is the first project I did here in Phoenix. And this project is called We Are the Dead. There's part one and part two. And this is actually a story of two brothers that were crossing over um, into Tucson from Mexico and they got lost. They ran out of water, it was very hot. They decided to break away and one of them made it to a Circle K shop. The other one was found dead with an empty bottle of tequila that was supposed to be a gift for their uncle who was gonna um, meet them. And so um, I had this story in my head since the early 1990s when I heard it and then um, my wife's father asked me to go hunting with them, Javelina hunting um, by Tucson. It turns out to be in this area where they got lost. So I was carrying a nine millimeter pistol and a two and a quarter camera as I was doing this work and I was pretending to be hunting. Um, <laughs> and so the, the images that you see is basically the nav where they separated and the graphics are basically the same as this, what was on the floor left over um, you know, uh, drinks, um, clothing, and so I took those um, colors and created this um, graphic representation. So there's sound to it, and I asked another artist in Mexico City to consider being the, the, um, the man who is dying. What's his last five minutes after drinking a whole bottle of tequila, being in the desert, what does he see? And I gave him that prompt and he created a series of poetic gestures, poetic texts, that runs through the video um, 
in between the different um, sections of the animation. The second part, I asked another friend who is a historian who specializes in American and Mexican history, and I, I gave him a call one day because I had this idea, and I said, his name is Moises, and I said, Moy, can you drink a bottle of tequila in one sitting? And he said, yes, I think I can do that. And I said, okay. So I want to I wanna propose something to you, and I want to propose considering being the brother that survived. And I'm going to give you one prompt, and the only text I gave him was, I no longer speak Spanish since my brother passed away. And then he started to drink a bottle of tequila as I was recording him, and he came up with this story. And it's a series of kind of poetic texts and stories that he came up with as he's drinking the bottle of tequila, thinking of the a sentence that I gave him and sort of assuming the role of his brother. Um, and that also is part two of it. Um, the one on the right is actually a newer work as well. And this is called Daydreaming. And if you look at this work, it's a series of, I believe there's 19 pieces. And when you look at it, these are actually portraits of the border fence between Mexico and the United States. And again, you've seen the same idea of sampling what was in front of me underneath my legs. I created this different um, abstracted uh, geometric shapes to it to create this sort of imaginary wall between us right now. Um, and a little bit further to the right, the black and white images are actually photograms. I'm not sure if there's photographers here or if you know what a photogram is, but a photogram is one of the first photographs created. And basically it's black and white photography. And basically it's an object laid on top of the paper that's exposed with light and then it's developed. And so here are remnants of what people um, left behind as they're crossing into the United States from their journey. And so a lot of the colors that you see that are sampled here come from the shapes that you see in the photograms, such as combs, uh, kids' socks, IDs, prayer cards, makeup, uh, toothpaste, and purses, and so on. So those are the objects that actually create the colors um, that you actually don't really see until you are next to them here. And one final piece that I'll let you venture into um, is a video installation. And um, that video is really special. It's really interesting because, as I mentioned, my family is very diverse in, in all saying. And so one of my aunts said, one time I went to visit um, my family, and he said, Mijito, I have, I have this friend of a friend. And for $1,000, you can have access to this workshop, un taller. And so that taller is a new way of smuggling people and drugs. And so they still haven't found it. Um, and so what they do is that they hollow out logs and either put people or drugs in it. So I was allowed access for a couple hours, one camera, basically one take. And I filmed this video for a couple of hours until you see at the end what happens. But basically, it's a 20-minute video. And there's a sign that is called Invaders as well in it. So it's a black and white video, but with the red and the glaring um, image of the neon, some of the gray areas in the video become this really saturated with um, beautiful dreamlike imagery. Um, and it's a silent video with a soundtrack created by a couple of musicians I collaborated with. And that's called Contrabando. Um, and I think we are at the time where we should be. And so um, this is the part where um, you ask me any questions you'd like. Anyone? The soundtrack, the, the, the you, you've got some of the sound of the actual drilling and then you've got loop sounds of drills that are in pitch that are kind of lull you into this sort of calm while you're watching the, the craftsman w work the wood. Um, uh, the, 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 you, you've chosen sounds very, very carefully that, aren't necessar that don't necessarily have anything to do with what you're doing, but, but to, to, to get a feeling, to, to, to convey an emotion. Is, is, that, is that correct? Yes, and so a lot of times I do like field recordings. So not only do I want you to see the location, where these are shot, but I also want you to get the sounds as a, as, a, as a document. And so I usually mix field recordings. So if I'm somewhere in the desert, I'll just take a tape recorder and record that, and then I'll resample it and create a different sound.
from it, but I always liked the idea that the, the active sound where it was shot is still there when you see it, when you see the work. Um, how do I position the work? Is it neutral or is it advocacy? Definitely is advocacy um, for change, for looking at various different alternative forms of social change um, that is necessary right now, especially being here in Arizona in our relationship to Mexico and the other Americas in that sense. Um, but I also try not to just have it like a protest art. You know, I want people to be invited to look at the colors, to, the, to be involved with the sounds, and then kind of look or talk about deeper meaning of the work itself. And, you know, everything has little descriptions that really go deeper into the work itself. Um, but, I, but I, you know, it would be difficult for me as an artist to go as an outsider and do this kind of work if my family or I myself wasn't involved with it. I'm just wondering again, maybe I didn't hear the colors and shapes that are over these and that, where did you say that's from basically? So those are sampled from whatever I see on the floor. So that's bottles of water, soda, labels, clothes. I just sample it in, in you know, like Photoshop or one of those digital programs to create those um, objects. I just want to say uh, congratulations for a fantastic body of work. Um, I understand you do some um, reciprocity with artists from Mexico coming to the ASU Museum, is that right? Um, well, it's different. It's, um, so as a curator, uh, one of the focuses at the ASU Art Museum is working with artists from the Americas, from Latin America. So we, we commission a lot of artwork from artists, emerging artists, established artists, from Latin America and from the Americas as well. Um, so that's something that I also bring in as an artist and part of my interest. You know, and again, um, being an artist curator in that sense, sometimes it's hard to, they influence each other basically. And so um, that is one of the focuses that we do uh, at the AC Art Museum that we also do with Kala Alliance as well. Um, can you talk more about um, how this work has shifted relationships within your family in terms of like maybe tensions or moments of greater understanding that have been produced? Because you talked about how um, uh, heterogeneous it is when you're sitting around the table and you have people from these kind of almost opposing sides of, um, of this issue. Um, well, it, it always works out when it's a, a holiday or an event because there's usually food and drink in front of you. And so it's, it's sort of like a negotiation that happens that is, um, um, I think one of the ways that um, I think can be a more um, viable way of um, getting to know each other and different points of view. Um, but I think that when I had that show in San Diego, when I mentioned previously, my family did not know what I did. It's like, oh yeah, you're an artist or whatever. And then they came to see the show and I remember my grandfather came up to me and my grandfather said, okay, now I understand what you do. Your work is about us. And so, um, yes. I promise I won't give you a zinger. I told him this morning that I was gonna ask him a really hard question and put him on the spot. But you just mentioned your grandfather and you have a really interesting story about that. Can you also talk about, because it's not represented here, but another big part of your practice is food and history, and it, I think your grandfather has a big part to play in that. Can you just tell us a little bit about that? Okay, upcoming projects, my grandfather food. So back to your question is, um, I always felt um, having food with your family was very important in sitting down and discussing certain things that you're uncomfortable with. Um, and. Um, um, that led me to do a project called um, Interrupted Passage. That was about the last eight hours from California was Mexico. And in that project, the then governor of Alta California, which is basically from LA to the end of California, um, he was um, taken by the Texas militia. And so um, he was um, gonna be arrested. 
And he said, well, why don't we talk about California and the future of California? So he invited the Texas militia into his house in Sonoma, California, and made an eight-hour meal to them, for them. And so this way of negotiation through food and through hospitality, I think, is incredibly special. And so I began being really interested in, in um, historical dinners, such as this one. And so I ended up working with a friend who became a chef, food anthropologist, and so we found um, what they ate for those eight hours, and I ended up creating this reenactment, and people ate in various different projects, from 50 people to 450 people at various stages. The last one was at Museo Tamayo in Mexico City for 150 people. And so I continue doing these food-based projects. There's a new one that I'm actually doing in Los Angeles in October, that's a public art project um, that is uh, based on an author from Mexico, Carlos Fuentes. He wrote a book called The Orange Tree, and the book is about the introduction of the orange into the Americas. And there's five short stories in the book um, that talk about the introduction of the orange. We think of the orange being you know, Southern California and so on, but really it comes from a different journey. And so we're working with um, chefs from around this neighborhood where I'm doing the project to talk about their um, history of immigration into the United States and what they left behind, but also specifically what they left behind in, re in regards to a culinary food item. And we're gonna create a menu based on five different neighborhoods in Los Angeles, and it'll be a public art project in October that the food will be free. Um, and you know, and the food that we make actually is quite amazing. It's not just like, okay, here's some food. It's, you know, there's different styles, there's different um, sequences, there's sound involved, and there's scent, um, and there's sound as well. And so, it's, um, I, as I mentioned, I use any medium necessary according to the project that I'm creating. And so this project will be special, and it'll be, it's called Current in, sound, in, in um, LA and it's actually free. It'll be every Sunday in October. So first, it's so great to see your work in Phoenix, period. Like, I, I feel like I'm shocked that this hasn't happened, so thank you to Phoenix Art Museum for uh, making that possible. But I'm wondering how being in Arizona has influenced your work and are you noticing directions or vocabulary? I, I feel like I have an understanding of how that has shaped your curatorial practice, but as I'm seeing your new work, I'm, I'm very curious about how or, or hasn't um, being here uh, affected that. I think the main interest that I look at is actually the landscape. You know, when someone lives here, they move here, you know, it's an enchanting landscape, but it's also very deadly. And so there's a very big difference between crossing over from Tijuana into San Isidro as opposed to from Nogales into Tucson or Phoenix, and it's a really harsh terrain. So I think a, a lot of what I've been focusing on has been that landscape and tra traversing that landscape. And a lot of the stories dealt with that in regards to something like even the Devil's Highway that for hundreds of years has been known to have um, um, this mysterious um, location that people basically disappear. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you again for coming tonight. <laughs>